just um, maybe new to Survivor or want to know a little bit more about what we do. Um, Survivor is a nonprofit organization, um, really a global community of patient advocates who inspire and empower those affected by cervical cancer through education and motivating each other to use our voices for creating awareness to end, um, to end stigma and influence decision and change around cervical disease. Um, I've spent a lot of time with Survivor dedicated to this outreach and work um, in women's health education since my own diagnosis of endocervical adenocarcinoma or invasive cervical cancer at the age of 34. Um, with more than a decade of that survivorship and advocacy leadership um, through Survivor, I've learned how to creatively engage with people, teams, communities, I'm reaching out to the media. Um, but ultimately that work is to change hearts and minds around um, HPV cancer prevention. So I'm so happy to be moderating this panel today um, called Cervical Cancer and Clinical Trials or Real World Experiences. I'm joined today by three amazing panelists, um, Dr. Oliver Rosen, Carol Lacey, and Jen Myers. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, we're going to ex we're extending our gratitude as well to Squeeze for sponsoring this webinar today. Uh, it's an opportunity to learn some of the latest and um, cervical cancer clinical trials from firsthand knowledge, which is critically important because a lot of us as patients either didn't know about clinical trials going into this, didn't know much, or really didn't know how to navigate, even how to ask the questions. So this panelist, um, our panelists are going to join in just a few minutes. Um, as we get started, we want to welcome everyone um, from wherever you're logging in today. Um, some housekeeping items before we get started. Because this is a webinar format, we won't be able to see or hear you. So we're going to be communicating through the Zoom chat box. If you've got any general questions um, about the presentation, go ahead and type them into the question box on your Zoom screen that's located just below there if you're not familiar. And if you've got questions specifically for our panelists, um, go ahead and utilize that Q&A feature in your Zoom screen. Um, I'll bring those up during the presentation and we will have plenty of time for your questions at the end. So thank you so much for taking the time today. Um, without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our panelists to you. And our first panelist today, um, joining me in sunny California, which we just confirmed, um, is Carol Lacey. Hi, Carol. Um, Carol is a metastatic recurrent cervical cancer survivor, um, a double ostomate, and our lead survivor ambassador. Um, she's dedicated to the survivor community by providing support, helping to educate and empower other patient advocates so that survivor's mission of cancer prevention is heard far and wide. Um, Carol, go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself and your personal experience with clinical trials. Sure. Thank you, Lori. It's so great to be here with everyone today. Thank you. Um, as Lori mentioned, I am a recurrent metastatic cervical cancer patient. Um, so that means I went through um, lots of chemotherapy. Um, I had, um, as Lori mentioned, uh, a couple of surgeries, radical hysterectomy, total pelvic extremation. Um, so with those reoccurrences, I had an opportunity to participate in a clinical trial that was offered to me through my oncologist. Um, it was a phase two trial. Um, it would be uh, CT scans every six weeks, and it would I would have uh, my personal um, physician's assistant who would be um, helping me, guiding me. Um, I would do weekly blood draws. And um, my time in that trial was about 16 weeks. Um, we saw some good um, progression or no progression um, the first uh, two times. And then as I uh, continued on that trial, unfortunately it didn't work for me, but knowing that I was participating in a trial and that whatever outcome um, I had would be you know, moving that drug forward. So um, I was, it was a great opportunity for me. I really had not a lot of knowledge about clinical trials prior to um, being on one. And um, if it wasn't through my oncologist's office, I'm not quite sure I would um, have found the trial itself. So um, just having that awareness and being offered that was, uh, was huge. So 
So that's my story in a nutshell with uh, you know the clinical trial I was on. Awesome, thanks, Carol. We'll we'll get a chance to chat with you a little bit more because I know I've got a lot of questions, and I'm sure that the um, our audience does as well. Um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our second panelist. Um, let me um, do a couple things here. Sorry, just real quick. Carol, we'll get back to you here. Um, I, I really appreciate you sharing your personal experience today because that, um, to me, knowing about someone else's experience would have been really helpful. I know going through what I went through because I never heard one option at all. It never came up until I got involved with the advocacy work. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that. And we uh, really appreciate that perspective. Um, so since we've heard from you from that patient perspective, let's hear a little bit more um, from the research side of things behind clinical trials. Um, I'm gonna introduce Dr. Oliver Rosen with Squeeze um, Biotech and um, give you a little bit of background information. Um, Dr. Oliver Rosen was trained in hematology oncology at University Hospital Charité in Berlin, Germany. Um, he brings more than 20 years of clinical and medical experience to his position at Squeeze, where he is responsible for the clinical oversight of the company's emerging pipeline. Um, prior to joining Squeeze, he oversaw the extensive um, clinical pipeline at Decephra Pharmaceuticals as chief medical officer. Um, and as well, Dr. Rosen received his MD from the University of Cologne in Germany. So welcome, um, Dr. Rosen, appreciate your time here with us today. And why don't you tell us a little bit about your work with Squeeze and cervical cancer? Oh, and Dr. Rosen, you're, you're muted. I thought I did it already. There so. we go. Thank you, Laurie. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, uh, uh, yeah, I wish it would only be 20 years of experience. Uh, but thank you for the compliment. So uh, uh, I, uh, I uh, will share my screen also now. Yeah, so I would really like to start um, kind of uh, building on what uh, you just said about the um, kind of research environment and, 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 and kind of how, um, and obviously, Carol, it was wonderful to hear from you how how we got to, how do we learn uh, about a clinical trial or so? And, uh, and so I, I uh, will say that I learned um, as a physician in the hospital when I practiced in Germany, I, I, I learned uh, relatively early on that sometimes I had a very different view how a patient would feel about their cancer treatment compared to how I felt it was going. And, uh, and that uh, was something that was open-minded once you kind of had and it's also obviously a, a meta of experience in your academic career to get more comfortable and then to say, tell me more how you think it's going. And, uh, and that was really eye-opening. And so uh, now um, with uh, squeeze back technologies, we really focused early on, on on doing what we're doing with input from patients so that we know that we're addressing what people really need and not just addressing what, what we think somebody else might need. Um, and so squeeze back technology is a very small biotech company with 100 people. Um, and um, um, in kind of uh, developing a very new platform. And uh, we have basically um, uh, two platforms right now. And so I would like to first kind of introduce you to the uh, commitment that Squeeze made to patients with uh, HPV-16 positive cervical cancers. So um, one of the two opportunities um, which both allow us to reinvent cell therapy by relying on a patient's own immune system. Uh, and so one is based on white blood cells and the other one is based on red blood cells. They both have their benefits um, and uh, that's why we're going after both opportunities. And so it is really important that we use these different uh, kind of natural processes uh, and immunological mechanisms to develop the best solution that we then can carry forward. Um, and uh, I would assume that this audience already has heard about immune, so-called immune checkpoint inhibitors. Um, and um, the, the, the current understanding of the oncology community is really that uh, um, these antigen-specific responses that a vaccine would trigger, that they would be then amplified in combination with other modalities, as an example, in combination with uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors. And so um, the, the, the 
so I'm, I'm trying to compare and contrast a little bit of two platforms here. So one of the uh, platforms, the white blood cell based platform, um, our study is called Squeeze PBMC HPV 101. Um, and uh, here we use, uh, yeah, white blood cells as they are in everybody's bloodstream, we enrich them. Um, and so it requires a blood filtration process, so to say, and uh, the patient uh, is undergoing something which is called a leukophoresis. Um, and you, you're sitting um, as it is in, it kind of depicted here, um, and this machine where uh, on one side of your body, the um, cells are coming out of your body and then they go through this filter and then they come back on the other side. Um, so uh, this study is a bit more advanced already. And so uh, we were able to demonstrate already the safety of uh, this treatment and um, pr presented the data outside ASCO this year. And the monotherapy phase is almost completed. Um, we tested for this study for different dose levels. Uh, and we are currently uh, at the highest dose level. We have one patient uh, with um, metastatic uh, cervical cancer who stayed on uh, the study for more than 10 months. And uh, that was quite encouraging because the previous therapy had been pembrolizumab, which is a immune checkpoint inhibitor, and the patient um, had never had stable disease based on, on, on uh, pembrolizumab. And uh, we expect in fall this year to start a combination phase for this trial. The other study, the other platform is based on red blood cells. And um, so the name is very similar of this study, squeeze AAC HPV 101. And here uh, we use a, um, a simple blood draw of 200 milliliters um, to then manufacture this cast customized, uh, very kind of personalized patient treatment. Um, the study uh, is in the process of being activated uh, I will have um, the, the sites uh, at the end of, of my presentation. Uh, here we activate the study and the first uh, site will be San Diego, University of San Diego um, in um, hopefully in a couple of weeks. And then we'll start the monotherapy dose escalation for this one. And so the study design, so I try to make it a bit more high level here and it, it's applicable for both studies here. We have these different dose escalations um, when we use the vaccine only. And then we have a combination phase where we uh, combine it with uh, commonly known and approved um, immune checkpoint inhibitors, uh, nivolumumab or um, ipilimumab, and the white blood cell-based uh, study we also offer atizolumumab um, on, a, on a regular dosis. So patients can stay on the study as long as the drug is available and checkpoint inhibitors are provided for, for two years. And obviously, if, if, if the patient has a long benefit, we would continue also to provide this longer. Um, and uh, what is important is we try to really understand if it's tolerable, it's safe, uh, and also what does it do in, in, in the patient's body. So these are um, the different endpoints that we try to measure. Um, and um, it is obviously always a question, who can participate in these trials? And so patients must be 18 years or older um, to be eligible for this trial. And um, there's a kind of a, a, a white blood cell blood group, so to say, which is called HLA um, system, and uh, they have to be HLA2 positive here, so that's something relatively quickly detectable um, at, a, at a hospital. They have to have uh, documentation that it's cervical cancer and then non-curable uh, cervical cancer, and patients must not be uh, amenable to curative treatment, so um, like surgery or radiation or, or chemo radiation, um, and they must have progressed on one systemic therapy um, and uh, uh, will have progressed before they get on our study. And, uh, and so then if patients are interested in the study, um, then they must be willing to do this leukophoresis, uh, what I had shared, um, or uh, provide this uh, red blood cell donation. Um, and um, hosp the hospital would obviously make sure that they have a good venous access so that uh, uh, the um, own blood cells can be collected. And so here I try to kind of, in, in layman's terms, to describe what uh, these cell-based cancer vaccines are. Um, so they're made from a uh, patient's own blood and they help to attack the, the body's cancer. And, um, and so the treatment itself gives uh, a patient's body the instruction, so to say, to destroy the cancer cells. 
And um, when combined then in this combination phase with um, an immune checkpoint inhibitor, uh, one would expect that uh, there might be even a better efficacy of the two together. And um, I need to emphasize this, these are early development programs, so we have not proven yet that they can effectively treat cancer, but that's obviously our, our um, goal to, um, to, to demonstrate. And as we heard before, um, it is every participation of the Senate clinical trial contributes to developing these drugs. And on the right side of the slide, I tried now to just in, in, in simpler terms to describe what the, um, uh, act, the, the cancer vaccine does. So this is a, a very complicated, uh, what is called a cancer immunity cycle uh, that um, scientists have agreed on now for more than 10 years that this is how this works. And, um, and so we are basically supporting initial steps of um, a patient's immune si system to destroy cancer. Um, and, uh, and obviously we know a patient who has cancer, um, they need help. The, the immune system is not able to destroy the cancer by themselves. And so we support uh, with our um, cancer vaccines, early steps of this cascade, and then the immune checkpoint inhibitors um, they take care of kind of later stages of this process. And I'd be always happy to address more questions during the Q&A session. Um, so the last slide now here summarizes the, um, the uh, um, um, different sites where we have the study open. Um, so we have a lot of studies already open for the uh, white blood cell based study. The last site that we'll open up is the University of Oklahoma um, in September, uh, so next month. And then um, I had mentioned for the red blood cell based approach, uh, we will activate University of San Diego in August and then several other um, US sites. Um, and for um, attendees from outside of the US, um, we also have one study open in Canada, um, in Toronto, um, for those who are listening from, from Canada. And um, I'm pretty sure that late, later on, you can get the information here um, in, in, in different forms, patient advocacy at speech biotechnology, um, if you're interested in learning more about this. And with here, I give it back to you, Laurie. Thank you. Awesome, thank you so much. I don't, <laughs> I don't know about you all, but now I have 40 new questions. Um, I, think, I think what's really interesting when we're presented with slides that show the science behind things that show all the inner workings of trials, all, all of this really great information is we say, okay, we want more, <laughs> we want to know more about this. But also there's the, the part of me that remembers back to being a patient for someone who didn't even know what a clinical trial was. So um, I think that's you know something that we need to talk about a little bit more too, either in this discussion today or kind of queue up, you know, how do we start learning a little bit more, not, not just the science behind them, but you know, how do I get involved with this? And how do I start those questions with my doctor to make sure? And then learning too from your side, you know, knowing that there's perhaps a gap between what the patient experience is gonna be getting into something like this versus the research side is a critical piece to bridging that gap in the future. So I'm so glad we're having the discussions and table that because I'm gonna come back to a couple of questions I saw from, from your slides. So I wanna go ahead and just say hi to everyone too that's joined us that might be viewing on Facebook or if you're joining a little bit later on and you're viewing this after the live session, um, welcome. We're so glad to see you all here. And we do have one more patient panelist that I wanna share um, with you. Um, Jen is joining us and Jen's gonna give us the perspective of somebody who is um, currently in a clinical trial. So thank you, Dr. Rosen for for that introductory piece of it. I think that is gonna be a good springboard for our questions here in a minute. And um, thank you to Squeeze as well for all the incredible work that you're doing for the cervical cancer community. Um, so our next panelist, Jen Myers. Um, hi, Jen. Um, give you a little bit of background here on Jen. She is a recurrent metastatic cervical cancer patient currently in a clinical trial, like I mentioned earlier. Um, having to leave her career, I know, to concentrate on her treatments, um, Jen's now dedicated to helping others with uh, cancer diagnosis and was even featured in MD Anderson's annual report um, for her work with online support groups. Um, Jen's also an active member of the survivor community, um, providing support to others and sharing her story 
to educate people about cervical cancer prevention um, and more. So Jen, would you mind sharing a little bit about your story and personal experience here today? Thank you, Lori. Of course, I'm happy to be here and be able to share what I know about clinical trials. And, um, you know, I start with a quote that says, you may not want a clinical trial, but in the end, you quickly realize it's exactly what you needed. And that is absolutely what happened to me. You know, how I considered the clinical trial is I was under treatment. This is my third diagnosis with cancer and it did um, metastasize. And the conventional treatments that I was on were just very difficult for me, not just controlling the tumors that I have, but also all the side effects on my body. So my oncologist wanted me to meet with a member of the, a clinical trial at the facility that I go to. And I'll be honest, at the beginning, it was a little bit of a whirlwind. Um, you know, the onboarding for me was very quick, um, being able to get into the trial. And I would lie if I would say I wasn't nervous at first. But, you know, when I met with the actual doctor of the clinical trial, the head of the clinical trial, I think he did a great job of explaining why this particular trial was very important to me personally. You know, and he answered a lot of mine and my husband's questions right then and there. And then also I had a clinical coordinator, I think similar to what Carol said, who really kind of walked me especially at the beginning, because I wasn't sure, you know, what was going to entail being in this particular trial. Um, you know, constant monitoring, um, not only the progression or the lack of progression, but also the side effects, how my body is able to tolerate the, um, you know, the treatment and the ultimate goal, you know, my doctor constantly says it's not a, it's a marathon, not a sprint is the ultimate goal for me is to stop my cancer from spreading. Um, reducing tumors is probably the secondary but really the important part is making sure that it does not metastasize again and go into other parts of my body. You know, and moving on, there's some things that may be misunderstood about clinical trials, but I'm in a phase one. But when it moves to phase two, I may not go from the research, but they do have a compassion clause that I'm continuing to be able to get this treatment because it is working for me. It's working extremely well. You always have the ability to leave, whether it's something you and your doctor decide, you know, it's not a contract that you have to sign that if you do it today, you're obligated to it. For any reason, you can leave that trial. Um, they've adjusted mine. I've been in my trial for over two years and they've adjusted over the time for me personally um, for things that would help me live with the side effects. And, you know, at the end of the day, here's how I look at the reason I'm in this clinical trial, I've been in it for two years. I believe it is the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, I have outlived my diagnosis that I received when I was told I had cancer the third time by a year and a half so far, and I'm still going. And the most important thing to me is I'm helping others. I'm helping people currently with cervical cancer, and unfortunately, those in the future that will have it, just finding a treatment that you can live with it with minimal side effects and um, just really control it by using your own body and your own immune system. So thank you, Lori. I really appreciate the opportunity to share my story of my trial. Thanks, Jen. I, you know, it matters so much to hear your perspective and um, everyone on the panel today, everyone who's, you know, doing the work with Survivor, who's out there, who's telling their stories. Um, this is what will help us move that dialogue along. So. Thank you so much for everything that you are doing and sharing here today. I know this is not easy stuff to talk about always. And I appreciate that we're in a safe space to ask questions, to have real world discussions about this because if we don't know about it, we're not gonna be able to move the dialogue forward nor are we gonna be able to know how to talk to our own medical teams. So um, we're gonna, you know, as we kind of transition into the Q&A portion of this, um, I'm not sure. I'm still seeing you, Jen, on the screen. So hopefully we can we can pop me back over there. Um, let me see if anyone else um, can help me out. I'm not seeing the control for that. Um, but I, as we move into Q and A, um, for everyone who you're is on the joining screen, Lori. Yeah, you're you're on the screen. Oh, you are. Okay, I was still seeing her. So all good. Thanks, everyone. Um, for everyone who's joining us from the audience, feel free if you, the questions that you may already have, I've seen a few of them here as we've been going along. 
Um, if you've got questions now for our panelists, um, go ahead and type them in because we want to hear where your questions are in this particular subject. Um, Carol, I'm going to start with you, if you don't mind. Can you talk a little bit about how the discussion came up about having a clinical trial with your team? Because I know that a lot of us never heard the words clinical trial. Perhaps that was a staging issue, you know, where we were in the in the particular diagnosis. Um, but how did you hear about clinical trials first? And how did you start having that discussion with your medical team? So um, the conversation started with my oncologist directly. Um, I had just come off a Taxol, Carbo, and Avastin where uh, it had stopped working. So those were sort of the qualifiers for the immunotherapy clinical trial that was offered to me. So I kind of, you know, my experience aligned with um, the requirements of that particular clinical trial. And like you, I had, I mean, I certainly knew about clinical trials, but I had, you know, misconceptions, right? I thought, you know, am I going to get a placebo? Am I, you know, there was a lot of like, what does that entail? So knowing that this was a um, phase two trial, everyone in the trial, it was a small trial, there's about 30 of us. Um, we were all going to be receiving the drug and then being monitored very closely. So I don't think that I probably would have ever, um, I certainly wouldn't have known about this trial if it wasn't for my oncology team, for sure. How about the same question to you, Jen? Yes, similar to Carol, um, it what did come from my oncology team that I had. Um, you know, I was not reacting to the chemotherapy I was on. It was really, um, they had to actually take me off the first chemo I was on, put me on an a different type of chemo that wasn't quite as harsh on my body. And unfortunately, the tumor started to come back. So they um, sent me to the clinical team. So it was a direct referral from my oncologist to the clinical team. Okay. We've got, um, I've got a few questions kind of backed up here that I can that answer, but I want to go to our audience first. I, I see that um, Carla had asked about options for clinical trials for patients that are not residents in the US. Dr. Rosen, you had mentioned on one of your slides earlier about um, some trials outside. Um, can you talk just a little bit about geography and how that impacts the decisions for where uh, clinical trials are offered and maybe how um, someone would know if they're available in their region? Thank you, Laurie. Um, yeah, that's obviously access to care, access to innovative treatment options is critical. And, um, and sometimes, um, in early stages, uh, and Jen, I don't know about you, but you might have been lucky that something was close to you um, where you lived and had access to this. Um, I would say in general, uh, for these early phases, um, there's less sites where um, a patient can participate in the trial. But um, for our trial, for example, we offer travel supports and uh, other sponsors, I know there's other sponsors also provide travel support. Um, and it's always worth asking um, the, the physician, the, the treatment team early on uh, when somebody is kind of limited in, in their resources to say, do you have anything that might help me to participate in this, um, in this trial? Because obviously um, it's also important uh, kind of minority communities, for example, to allow them to participate in the trial. And, uh, and then uh, sometimes people can even give a bit more um, uh, on support. What's important is it should be an incentive. Um, so that's also important. But uh, the, uh, um, I would say most of the sponsors uh, would be happy to provide support and uh, to enable people to participate in the clinical trial and to support travel if needed. And when you say supporting travel with that, what kind of cost does that cover? Travel, like in terms of so, hotel and yeah, so flight, flight expenses uh, and hotel costs. Yeah. You know? Okay, that's good to know. I didn't really usually what's a, yeah, and usually we would also support a bit for meals. I mean, it, it needs to be in reasoning. I mean, it's it uh, we don't want to encourage people where to go on a trial where their uh, children are in college or something like this, but. Uh, 
it is it is really important to to know about these options um, and um, and the, uh, many many trials really offer these things supporting reason so you could really you could really participate in the trial and and pay get paid for the travel for example yeah. yeah that's that's good to know that's available so thank you for sharing that um one of the i'm going to move to the second question here one of the questions was on um learning a little bit more about specific trials that our panelists are on um i wanted i want to actually use that as a springboard to talk about privacy um and this would be for any of our panelists here um in terms of knowing you know what what, what how would um who would know someone is participating in a trial and and how do we how do we manage privacy how do we talk about it what do we want to share do we not want to share um specifically i don't think on this webinar we're going to share specifics on what um what our patients participated are participated in or are participating in but but how does that impact um someone's experience um to know um or to not know about what's um shareable and um you know um, what they would need to disclose to their communities i guess is where i'm going with that <laughs> that's for any of you it's just kind of a general question of um is this something I'd be happy to break the ice i'd be happy yeah. to break that so uh, so so as a as a sponsor as a company that runs a trial we don't even want to know and that's really important we don't even want to know the identity of a patient because it makes it harder also um to 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 know who this person is because i mean as soon as there's a personal component so to say involved uh, it, it makes decision making hard i mean a physician a treating oncologist is sometimes in a really tough spot when you know the patient and so sometimes we have patient reaching out to us and um and uh, then we always say please don't send us anything with your name um and uh, and um but we get you in contact with the right people uh, because we obviously also want to honor the HIPAA rules. Um, and, um, and so um, we, we know sometimes people are willing to share a lot of information that they might later regret. So we don't never want to be in that position. So when, when a patient participates in a clinical trial, all what we know is um, kind of an, an identification number so that there is really a cutoff uh, so the site knows then who they're talking about when we talk about the patient number, but it really allows us to have this firewall uh, and that nobody can understand who is a, is a given patient. Here. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, thank you. And I, I do um, thank you so much for bringing up the question about um, sharing information um, from our audience, because privacy is an important part of this. And I just want to make sure we, we cover that. Um, so, uh, and I'm gonna, you had, you had touched on this a little bit, Dr. Rosen, on access to trials and how, how are we as a kind of global community here, making sure that we're giving access to all specifically communities of color, um, those that might not have access to the knowledge about the clinical trial, is that information getting to communities or do we still have a gap there? I or think any of the other panelists can answer that as well. So Sorry, I go ahead, Dr. Rosen. Yeah, thank you, Jack. Yeah. So so I, I certainly do not want to pretend to say that everybody has access to this information. So I think um, we know there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, I and obviously we'll post the slides and then everybody can see the sites. What I will point out is, for example, the um, University of Kansas. Um, the physician, the, the principal investigator, Dr. Joaquina Baranda, uh, she is very dedicated to support uh, um, the underserved communities of uh, our communities of color, and uh, and and they have a very special program there. Um, but I would say that in general, all university hospitals um, they have outreach programs to share information to. Uh, discuss really the pros and the cons of a, of, a, of a clinical trial because there's a lot of anxiety and so I think um, clinical research uh, is now at a level of of um, um, yeah of, of um, transparency and and uh, uh, patient focus that it probably was not always um, and so that's why some people probably still have concerns 
about the participation participating in a participation in the clinical trial. I mean, we see this obviously now with COVID-19 vaccination and also some people have concern about this. But um, I really think it, it, a good question is to ask your doctor, would you recommend this to your loved ones? Um, and, uh, and, and then to understand uh, why they would not recommend this. But normally when somebody brings a clinical trial forward, they will have really looked into options. I think it was nice that uh, Jen shared that she would not be on the trial without the insight from the treatment team. So I think it is important to have a, a team you trust um, and, um, and to understand whether they're really on top of things uh, and then to listen to their proposals. And uh, sometimes they might even have two trials that would they, where they would say uh, both might be good for you and then to understand the pros and the cons of each of the different options. Yeah? Um, and um, the last thing, because I want to make sure that others can comment on this also, but the last thing I would say in this context is also um, sometimes um, the treatment teams might pick a trial and might say, um, so like in the situation of, of Jen's phase one trial or the phase one trial that we do, where they would say, I know right now you can participate in this trial, but it will take a long time until I can offer you this treatment again. And so as long as we monitor your cancer quickly, closely enough, then we can transition um, as, as soon as necessary to something different, but we would not want to, you to miss that opportunity. Yeah? Um, there might be other trials that are not as different in what's offered as standard of care. Um, so um, it might be sometimes also overwhelming, and that's obviously why I think uh, also as a sponsor, we're grateful for the work that Survivor does, where people can ask also questions then and, and get more insights. Yeah. yeah, I think this is a really good topic that we should continue having dialogue about for sure, because we don't have the time today to really dive deeper into it. But but clearly, um, we need to be having having these discussions to make sure that patients have that not only access to the information, but are being, um, um, you know, having the opportunity to, to ask the questions um, as well. Um, so I have kind of a two-part question. I, I want to um, be mindful of our time, but also um, talk a little bit to our patients about, um, or ask our patients about if you could start kind of for the folks on the call that might not understand the difference between say chemotherapy and radiation therapy and a clinical trial. Um, can you talk a little bit about your experiences of how those things differ just so we can all make sure that we're on the same page of where does this happen in the treatment and, and what's the experience like going through something like this versus the other treatments that you may have already had. And you touched on it earlier. So I was just hoping you could expand on that a little bit. That's for Carol or Jen. Um, I can start. So as far as the difference, you know, what I'm currently doing is um, infusion of an immunotherapy and a chemotherapy. Um, both are FDA approved, but they are not approved to be working um, together. So that is the current trial that I'm on. And I know there was a question. And I would like to say, you know, my trial may not work for everybody. How they determined was, um, you know, looking at the genetic makeup. And there were several trials that I was uh, qualified for. So I think it's really important not to say, well, I'm in this particular trial and it's working really well for me, is to really talk to your oncology team, get a referral to a team that can really look at you as an individual and find the specific one that's going to work specific for you. Um, you know, I, that's the trial I'm currently on. I know there are a lot of different trials that require different types of treatments from pills to, you know, different types of uh, frequency. So I think that goes back to what I'm saying is really meaning and specifically looking at the trial that would be best for you in your particular situation in your genetic makeup, to be honest. And that's how I ended up with the trial that I'm on today. Carol, anything else you'd add there? Yeah, similar, similar to Jen, um, I'm on, I was on an immunotherapy trial, <clears throat> a straight immunotherapy trial, um, because I had had traditional um, chemotherapy, the Taxol, the Carbos, 
Um, I had also had several surgeries. So at this point in 2015, it was about um, trying to um, keep the cancer at bay. And so this trial seemed like a very good option to do that. Um, and it, again, because I met all of the criteria for this trial, I had had uh, previously had had a vast, and so I, it was easy to be um, paired for this um, trial. I was a good candidate for it. Do you, Kara, one of the questions that came in is, as a patient, do you know the, the um, combination of therapies that you're on at the time, or is that private to you as well? I did know it was just the one therapy in my case. So it was okay. just the um, one particular drug. So it's not a blind study, for example. I don't know if I'm using that term correctly, but to the patient. Right. No, it, it was all transparent and um, okay. everything you know, was presented to me up front. And so I, I knew what was going on. And again, all of the patients in this particular trial were given the same um, uh, therapy. Okay. And I would say mine was very similar. I know the drugs that I'm on and I was told up front what those would be in addition to that there would not be anybody in this phase one on a placebo that I was guaranteed to get the, and I think that's a big misconception at times that you don't, there are trials like that, but there are, my trial was not, I knew I'm, I know I'm getting the drugs. I know what drugs I'm getting. And at the time, are you allowed to share that information out or are you requested to keep it? private. No, I, you can, you can share it. I mean, I can share it with anyone that I choose to share it with. Okay. Oh so, yeah. I was not required to keep it private. Okay. Well, I you hit, you used, blog post. <laughs> right. I'm glad you're, I'm glad you're sharing the information. I just wasn't, I wasn't sure. Um, you used a word. Well, about it. Oh, go ahead. May go I ahead. just, I mean, for one, one point, because I want to talk about the placebo just for one second, because I think that is so important. Um, so it's normally, um, when somebody gets a placebo, they, they still get standard of care. That's very important. They, they receive what they would get uh, also as standard of care, but then there is something added to this. Yeah? And, um, and so then in order to really kind of in a, what is called a phase three trial, when you want to see whether something is not just working, whether it's better than something else, then you do often these uh, blinded trials where, so you know, let's say it would be, um, Jen mentioned chemotherapy plus immune therapy. So then you would know that you would get the chemotherapy, you know exactly what chemotherapy you get, but you would not know whether you would get the immunotherapy or whether you would get a placebo, yeah? Um, so that's really important, this distinction. You, so you're not missing out on things. And, and a lot of sponsors also um, often then allow a crossover. Sometimes it's not possible. And that has to do with how, we measure whether something has a benefit for patient or not. Uh, but uh, the standard of care, nobody misses out on, on the standard of care, what you would get anyhow. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Rosen. So I'm going to kind of guide us through the last um, kind of 10, 15 minutes here of the discussion. We're going to go a little bit longer. Got the okay to do that because I think this is such an important discussion to keep going. Um, why, why do we, why are there so many misconceptions do we think out there? And Jen touched on this a little bit. Why do, why do we think that there are um, misconceptions or lack of knowledge of clinical trials today? That's for any of our panelists. Or what, what do you think might be some of the barriers to, other than what we've already covered today, what are some of the um, barriers and misconceptions we think? Is it just a lack of information? Is that where it starts that we just don't know enough about it as patients yet? I would agree with that, Lori. I think, you know, prior to me meeting with the targeted therapy um, team at the facility that I go to, my knowledge of clinical trials was a lot of misconceptions, like there's a placebo, you know, once I start this, you know, I can't stop. I'm never going to be allowed to go to any, no matter what happens. But I will say, you know, when my oncologist recommended it, he presented it to me as, um, you know, do you have the capability to fly down and meet with this team? You know, in a couple of days, this is, you know, the head of this particular trial. And I obviously trusted my oncologist. So I went down, but I didn't feel like there were, 
a pressure to to sign up right then and there. You know, he really did take the time to explain to my husband and I exactly what the trial was and really allowed me to ask a lot of those questions and was able to, and I did sign that particular day just because I felt very comfortable. But um, I also know there were a lot of things by the time I signed the papers within the two weeks until my trial could start before some of the insurances, you know, although the drug company pays for the drugs, there were some other things my insurances had to approve. And I think that they did an incredible job of giving me a lot of literature, videos to watch, um, literature on trials, questions. And the most important thing and to this day, two years later, is my clinical coordinator. She is my lifeline of going to that trial if I have questions, if I need to reach a team member or another team member, she is really that point person. So a lot of my misconceptions and nervousness about becoming or becoming part of a trial really dissipated once I met the team and I was given that, you know, personal connection to my coordinator that I had that I felt like even if I think it's a question I don't want to ask my doctor, she she's there for support had my eyes opened as to what a clinical trial is. And once again, you know, it wasn't, you have to do this, this is your only option. You know, it was just, they presented it to me in a way that I felt like I had the ability to make that decision or go a different direction. Um, so that that's why I think it's so important if someone's thinking about it is to really sit down and talk to those experts to answer those questions specific to you as an individual in your specific story and your specific treatment. And it sounds like your experience, Jen, should be what, what we're aiming for is the baseline of care in, in, in this scenario. I, I'm really thankful that you've had that opportunity. And Absolutely. I would, would hope to see us moving in that direction for everyone that's, that's um, interested or qualifies. So um, for the sake of time, I'm going to kind of lead us out here with, with a two-parter. One to Dr. Rosen. Um, again, like I said, I, I love hearing the science behind things, but then it just, it, you know, gets a lot of, got a lot more questions going. Um, and then I'm going to come back to our two patient panelists. Um, Dr. Rosen, what do you feel like are our next steps to kind of bridge some of this information between um, what, what the researchers are doing and what the teams are doing out there in the field? Um, to the patient? What, what do you think are some of our um, important um, next steps to try? Yeah, I would say the first and probably uh, most important step is really communication. I mean, that's why um, it, medicine has become much more complicated nowadays. Um, and, uh, and that's a good thing because we know more about cancers and the biology and um, what the cancer does to, to try to escape the treatment, so to say. Um, and also for physicians nowadays, it's much more complicated. There's much more subtypes of cancers. Um, and um, in the past, when you look at breast cancer, I mean, it's um, something that often, there's so many different subtypes. And now we, kn we know they have to all be treated differently. Um, and for cervical cancer, um, it's it's the same thing. There are differences, and uh, we need to really look at this. Um, I was glad that uh, Jen brought up the point about the genomics of the cell, the genetics of the cancer, and that the team was really paying attention to this to then find a good option for her, and and that's what we have to do. And so, I think it is for a physician or for a treatment team, it is a in some ways fine line to walk that the patient doesn't feel overwhelmed. Uh, with all the information. I think scientists want to explain what they're doing. And I mean, if I would ask a civil engineer about construction of a house, I would also eventually say, I'm, not, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm lost here. Um, so it's a fine line to walk. Um, but I, I would hope also a patient should really be very curious about this and take kind of um, this in their own hands and to say, I really want to understand what's out there and use resources like what Survivor has to offer. And, and um, um, just not being shy of questions. I think when you, and, and trust me, I, mean, I think we all have had experiences in our, um, with friends or families uh, with cancer. And so we all know that sometimes then people are nervous when they see a physician, they're waiting in line and, and then they 
finally get to see the team. So have a list of questions prepared and go over this and take the time to, to write notes and just say, I'm sorry, this is new for me. I, I Can you just speak a little bit slower? I mean, these are the, the basic things because then um, we feel more confident. I, I think Jen made an extremely important point. She said, I felt comfortable while I was there to say, I will join that tribe. And I think being able to make that decision is so important. And if we can say, I want to get on this trial, or I want to know a bit more, and here's what I do not yet know, or the other option is, I do not want to get on this trial. Uh, and to be clear about this, because I think not making a decision can be worse. I mean, if I just say, this is also scary to me, and it sounds so, um, yeah, above my head, that's probably not a good idea to then say, as a result, I'm not going on a clinical trial. Yeah? So I, I, it's, it's really hard to find a very concise way of what needs to be done next, but I think um, treatment teams are very dedicated to help the patient understand what they offer. But the patient has to also really say, I want to take my fate in my own hands. I mean, that, to be very clear, that was for me the reason why I went into, into cancer treatments. Uh, because if you tell a smoker, stop smoking, uh, they would say, not a good idea, tell me something different. And I always knew that from, from residency and so that cancer patients, a lot of them wanted to take charge of their own lives and um, be comfortable, even if it gets more complicated, uh, find resources. People are happy to find resources for you also and to, and to share this with you. Yeah? Being educated, then you can make a decision and then you know, I declined the trial or I did not decline the trial. But the, the recess, researchers are eager to explain they, there's a lot of more trials out there, um, and we still have a very, very low number of clinical of pa patients participating in a clinical trial. Yeah, and with all the options nowadays, uh, we need the willingness and the open mindedness of patients, not feeling like guinea pigs, but to say this is an opportunity for me, um, because Jen is a good example. I personally also know, um, I mean, not in person, but from patients on trials. For them, it was the best choice to get on a trial. There's others also um, where it did not benefit, but how many patients have the experience that standard of care doesn't work? Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for that. I, I think, you know, you've touched on something really important that we're a group of people that take action. And to know that there is a um, gap there where we need to be getting information to people where there are low numbers participating, um, that to me feels like a challenge <laughs> where I know that we're, um, that's why we're having these discussions is that we can start making change in, the, in that area. So as we kind of wrap up here, I want to um, turn over to Carol and Jen for just kind of one last closing question um, around patient decision. What do, you, what do you feel like you want to make sure that patients know today that maybe either you didn't know or they didn't know enough about, or just to encourage um, patients who might be looking into this option. Thanks, Lori. I would definitely encourage patients, especially those who um, uh, their current treatment isn't working for them or they've kind of hit a wall, is to um, ask, you know, have that, have those conversations with your oncology team. Um, ask about clinical trials, ask them, you know, are they getting that information about clinical trials? And just, you know, having those open conversations with your oncology team um, will help, you know, move your um, treatments forward too. Jen, any other kind of parting thoughts? You've covered a lot already, but anything yeah. else you'd like to add for folks? You know, once again, exactly what Carol said, you know, ask the questions. Um, my trial is not near me. Um, I travel halfway across the country for my trial. Um, and, you know, at the beginning, that was scary to start. But there are so, like Dr. Rosen said, there are so many resources available that I just didn't know. And those particular trial teams are there to help you with those resources, whether it's to help with travel, um, whatever that is. So my piece of advice is you can always say no. So what would it hurt to go research, try to find something and see if it, it would be something that would help you. 
I think that is a better approach than not doing anything at all, because there are so many available. And Laurie, I think Jen just said something very important that I want to really emphasize again, because I think Jen, you, you said you can always say no to a trial, but we need to be clear also, you can always during a trial say no. I'm done, traveling is too stressful for me. I can't do my job or my work or my, my family life and I'm not doing this anymore. But I think not trying, that could be really a, a big, big uh, decision that somebody might regret afterwards if they were to know somebody else who took part in a clinical trial and saw the benefit of this. So it's worth trying and then to say, it's too much for me, or here's why I don't want to do this anymore. Nobody will be upset. Um, the the, the process of informed consent in, in today's world is, is very clear. At any time, you don't have to provide a reason. You may just say, it's a very simple, I'm sorry, I don't want to do that trial anymore. And then people will just say, thank you for your participation. And uh, is there anything else that we can do? Or refer you back to the referring physician, whatever it is, but that's so important. Not saying, not trying is worse, could be worse than um, giving up when it's just not working or challenging. Yeah, and that communication is key, I think. Um, you know, part of, part of um, our, you know, our tendency of what we do here is we talk about being informed and empowered. And yeah. um, that is, is critical, of course, to all of our our experiences with, um, with cervical cancer. So I, for the sake of time here, um, I'm going to, I'm going to wrap us up. I think this is just the, the tip of the iceberg, if you will, on some of these discussions. So, um, if there's anything, you know, urgent that you want to make sure that we ask in the future, do type it in now. We'll make sure to record that for, um, future dialogue we have here. Um, I think we've covered all of our immediate questions. So I just, I want to thank, um, each and every one of you for bringing up those firsthand experiences because, um, this is helping to bring clinical trials to the forefront. And this information is incredibly important. Um, and I know that just having the dis these discussions are gonna help people in the future. So as we wrap up here, um, I know there's one more thing we wanna share here um, on screen, but we wanna make sure to, of course, thank um, Squeeze again for sponsoring our webinar. Um, if you've got more information and you would like to learn more about this topic, um, we've added the information for you on the screen here for Squeeze Biotech as well as survivor.org. And um, this is incredibly important information. So thank you so much for everyone's time today um, for this session. We are so thankful to have you here and to keep um, this momentum going and look forward to um, seeing you all again in the future. So until next time, Thank you everyone so much and stay safe.